Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Nancy Holgray from CNBC, and we'll have to apologize up front for the American accent introducing the Finnish names here, but thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I really want to get started with Vice President Katainen here talking about what else Europe must do to really keep the growth, keep the momentum going for the European tech sector. Because for everyone who's seen the slush report put out, it's been an incredible year for European startups. However, still some significant challenges when we talk about keeping pace with the rivals in Silicon Valley and even some of the startups we've seen on a valuation metric in China. So from where you stand, talking about this 315 billion euro investment, what are your top priorities going there? Yeah, thank you very much. First, I have to say that very nice to be back in Schloss. This looks, uh, the setup looks slightly different than, than previous events, but, but Berhina seems to be the same, which is the most important thing. Um, so what, what added value the European Union can bring to startup society or to growth and job creation, more generally speaking, there are two issues. First, we want to focus on risk financing. Uh, European decision makers have changed banking regulation, for instance, during the last few years, and it has had positive impacts, but also as a negative impact, uh, the bank's risk bearing capacity, capacity has reduced. So we got feedback from the market that there's plenty of liquidity everywhere. Don't pump up more public money to the market. But if you want to do something, uh, create more opportunities for risk financing. And EFSI, European Fund for Strategic Investment, is exactly a new fund for risk financing. It, apply, it, it provides financing for, for uh, SMEs, startups, through local intermediaries. Jan is representing European Investment Bank, and EFSI is part of this bank. The only thing the entrepreneur must know if somebody wants to get financing from uh, EFSI is the phone number of the European Investment Bank. The second thing uh, what EU can do is to create better single market. For instance, in digital area, we still have 28 different copyright regimes, same amount of uh, different uh, data protection laws, etc. So now our aim is to create more harmonized regulatory environment in order to create a um, level playing field and single market for entrepreneurs and for consumers to, uh, to trade cross-border. Okay, and I want to go to Mikael Pekvelen, and you have this perspective of <coughs> your company. The early stages when you started up, looking to scale the company seems to be a big issue when we talk about success for European tech firms. We talk about scaling globally, both outside Europe, but there's such a huge opportunity. Do you feel that more could be done from the policymakers to reduce these barriers just here in Europe? I, I, think the, you know, I think they're doing just the right thing now. They're acknowledging that the tech sector is growing rapidly. Uh, we have the competence here in Europe. Uh, we have the education. Uh, so, and we have the global mindset from start. So people are thinking globally from start. So I think they're doing the right thing. I think they can ease up the regulation still especially when it comes to you know, risk-taking for commercial banks. I'm, we're completely lacking that in Europe compared with the US. So if there's something they can do there, that, that would be really a, you know, a great asset for us. OK, and Vice President Papavori, when you talk about how you invest in the small, medium-sized firms providing capital, largely through institutions and venture capital firms, how can you incentivize risk-taking? I'd like to start by saying that EIB is the EU bank. We are by far the biggest financial, financial institution in the whole world. We are twice as big as the World Bank. So, of, of course, we are involved in more or less all kind of businesses around Europe. Uh, we are lending roughly 80 billion a year, but of course, we are lending mostly to big companies. Then we also lend to SMEs, but through intermediates, through local banks, we have framework loans with us. But then we also have a um, risk capital arm, the European Investment Fund, which is by far the biggest single player in the whole European uh, venture capital market. I think we are engaged in roughly 80% of all venture, big venture capital funds in, in, in Europe. Okay, and Mikael, if you can give us a bit more information on how you obtained the financing from the EIB and what that experience was like for you. It was a very simple process, actually. So uh, EIB, there's kind of two, two ways to access the cash. One is the going through the European Investment Fund, right? The Horizon program. 
which is uh, basically uh, it's for for tech uh, for development. Once you pass that needle eye, uh, it's it's a much easier task to deal with the investment bank, European investment bank, because basically they've done their due diligence already. Then, so for us, once we passed uh, the Horizon Fund, uh, I think it was something like six to eight weeks to complete the transaction with the European investment bank, which was by my uh, experience going back 20 years dealing with venture capitalists was the most easiest and most convenient process I've ever been in. And was it simply just receiving the funds or is there a role for advisory and assisting you with the process as well? No, I, I think it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very flexible instrument. It's a facility which we can draw down upon when we need it. So it's basically a, a kind of a growth financing for us. And, and uh, there's very little governance attached to it, so it's a very flexible instrument. And do you think more needs to be done to let startups, entrepreneurs in Europe know that this financing is available, which, as you said, a lot of it goes through intermediaries at the moment? Definitely. And I mean, the team there is, uh, I mean, European Investment Bank is pretty big, uh, if you look at the size, but the team is extremely competent. And uh, I think there are some 200 Finns working there, actually. So they are extremely knowledgeable and extremely common. I think people are afraid of actually approaching them. It's been seen very much like some kind of a nationalistic bank. And it's, it's a very, it's actually, it's a very, it's, it's like any commercial bank uh, should be treated. Does that resonate? Actually, Nikke Pakwalen is representing the smallest possible company who has had a direct access to our lending. And all the smaller companies and the early stage companies, they do not um, handle their cases directly with us. Uh, but, uh, for example, the European Investment Fund is the biggest single player also in the Finnish venture capital market. And we are engaged in all the big venture capital funds in, in, in Finland. So I can say that most of you who have received some investments from some venture capital funds in Finland, you have also received EIB money, even if you maybe don't know it. Yeah. But not only EIB, it's EIF as well. So th that's, a, that's one actually eligible okay. for all companies. So that's what Europe is doing on one level to address the capital, the funding concerns. But VP Katainen, if I could go back to you, really on bringing down the barriers across Europe and encouraging growth among startups. Let's talk a bit more about the technology in terms of helping companies sell across borders. When you talk about the single digital market, where are you in that process and what areas do you still think need to be addressed first and foremost? Be yeah, thank you. Before going there, uh, uh, we could ad advertise together with Janne EIF, European Investment Funds Facilities, to venture capital funds. Because EIF, like Janne said, uh, provides funding to intermediaries, like private venture capital funds. If some fund manager here consider it reasonable, you can contact EIP or EIF already today looking at the opportunities, what they have to offer to you. But coming back to your, your question on um, digital single market, where we are now, uh, my colleague Andrus Ansip, who is also a vice president of the European Commission, former Estonian prime minister, he is in charge of uh, creating concrete proposals in order to harmonize the regulation in digital market. He will... Um, make a concrete proposal on, uh, on copyright regime harmonization by the end of the year. This is one of the first proposals he's going to do. And there are together 16 concrete proposals coming by the end of next year, which all will harmonize the regulation or regulatory environment in Europe, just, by, just for making it easier for uh, companies to operate across border, but also easier for consumers to buy products. For instance, one of the area is geoblocking. We want to ban geoblocking, which means that if you have legally bought some products here in Finland, but then you move to Brussels or to Sweden, you cannot anymore to use the same digital product because there are uh, the geographical blockage. And uh, this is an obstacle. They don't have similar geoblocking in the United States. So we have very compact well-functioning continent, and we have to allow the businesses to go across border better than it does at the moment. And you mentioned the need to harmonize regulations, and I'm wondering what the Commission is doing, whether it's consulting entrepreneurs, consulting people who are actively involved in tech to stay on top of the latest innovations, because of course, as we all know, with innovations changing every day, 
there is this argument that perhaps regulators, policymakers can fall behind the technology. Is that a concern for you and how are you trying to bridge that gap? Our process is always goes like this, that one, in this particular case, for instance, uh, Andrus Ansip has decided, or the college, uh, the commission has, as a whole has decided that we need to do proposals on those 16 areas, which I already mentioned, including harmonization, copyright regime. We sent questions or we launch a public consultation during which we expect private sector, for instance, to advise us how to do it, what are the real challenges, what are the problems, and what is the best way to address those challenges. So we don't work in a silos or in Brussels bubble. Instead, we, we, we are uh, collecting feedback from private sectors and those who are already in market and, and, and try to get feedback in order to get it right. And one sector that strikes me is still in some ways suffering from a lack of clarity on regulation is the sharing economy, of course. Mm. And I believe you've been quite outspoken that we have to address this and trying to just halt Uber altogether is a bit unrealistic. So where does the Commission stand in terms of harmonizing its regulatory approach to the sharing economy more specifically? The EU Commission is very strongly in favor of sharing economy business models because it's the future anyway, whether we like it or not. And um, it's, I mean, what it's all about, it's about new business model which is using new technologies for consumers and there is a demand in the market and we have to look very carefully in Europe whether our current uh, regulatory environment really fits for purpose. And this is not the case, for instance, in transportation sector. I, on, I understand perfectly well that if you change the license-based regulatory environment, it has some impacts, and all those impacts are not necessarily positive. But um, if you don't allow new business models to enter to the market, you kill much more than is necessary. So the Commission does not have any official policy towards Uber, for instance, but we are strongly in favor of new business models. And what we are doing at the moment is to give guidance to member states how to further develop their regulation in order to be more um, um, open for new business models. For instance, European uh, legislation on services, it allows uh, uh, sharing economy business models. And, but in member state level, there are some other legislations which ban those. And now we want to encourage member states to harmonize the regulation in order to, to create better business environment for sharing economy. Okay. And Mikhail, do you want to weigh in on this from you being an advertising company? Perhaps the regulations of more concern to you may be data and privacy. But what were the challenges like for you both in starting and trying to grow the business now when it came to meeting the different regulations across Europe? Sorry, can you repeat that question? In terms of your challenges meeting different regulatory standards across yeah. Europe, if you could shed some light on what that was like for you starting the business. So one good example was we actually, <coughs> products is also a way of advertising. And we actually, um, when we started off the business, we actually uh, stumbled across the VAT is not deregulated and it's not equal in every country. And, and uh, everything around VAT, taxation and all of that stuff is still, there's a lot of, mess around that and, and so the harmonization is there is, is, is quite still on the way and that prevented us from doing a proper business but that was three years ago. Okay now let's shift back to the investment providing capital angle again um, Vice President Vavori if you can weigh in. You did mention that right now a lot of your support is going to larger companies but I'm wondering when we talk about the different stages here too there's some concern that in Europe when we talk about further growth of startups that there's a fair amount of capital available at the early seed stage, but not enough at the later stages. Do you think the EIB could play a role in helping advance further availability of capital as companies progress? Oh, of course we can, and we have done it already. We are strongly involved in all stages, but um, what we do directly is that we handle with big companies. Then we, of course, have a uh, a lot of deals with local banks and local uh, national promotional banks and, and through them we are also investing SMEs. I think that we financed 110,000 SMEs last year in, in Europe. And then, as I also said, through our um, investment fund, we are also a very active player in the, in the venture capital market in all stages. So, so of course, because of, all, of our size, you could say that we are involved in, in, and engaged in all sectors and in all stages. 
all sectors, all stages. And where do you see sector-wise the strongest demand? I know you're across all, but is there one specific area that sticks out as having the most demand for funding through financing? Once again, it's maybe a quite dull answer, but because of our size and because of the fact that we are the EU bank, we are owned by the 28 member states, we need to be involved and engaged in each and every sector. But of course, I think everything which is linked to the digital world, to the digitalization, is, is a, of course a key priority because it changes the business model and business logics in, in all sectors at the moment. And we've talked about needing to increase the risk appetite here, encouraging banks to take on more risk when they invest. But inevitably with that, more speculative investing comes failure sometimes. So if you're invested in an enterprise that fails, does that fall on the intermediary that you've put the money through, or does that come back to the EIB? No, it's echoing, so <laughs> I didn't hear uh, exactly, but um, if, if I come back to the, the commission's role and what we are doing at the moment, so I think the, the situation in Europe roughly at the moment is that, of course, we don't have a shortage of money. And even the interest rates are lower than ever. But we have a shortage of risk-bearing capacity. And that is the big change the Commission is trying to do at the moment. Yeah. We need more public money in order to generate more private money in order to take more risk. And that is also the big change we are seeing in the bank. So we are increasing our risk profile a lot in the, in the future in order to do that. And also pumping much more money to the venture capital funds in order to get access to, to risk capital also for companies which have not been able to do that so far. I suppose the question I was trying to articulate though <clears throat> is how do you hedge against the risk in the event that these enterprises fail and are not successful? We are a bank. <laughs> uh, we are a different bank because we are a non-profit bank but we are still a bank. We only finance bankable projects. Vice President Katainen, does that <clears throat> resonate with how you feel about increasing the risk taking here? Yeah, sure. how, how to increase risk taking on behalf of the banks. Do you think that's something that still needs to be done? Well, I mean, the EFSI itself is uh, the way to uh, decrease the risk of private investor. The, uh, as, uh, as I said before, uh, Europe is not lack of, uh, lacking of liquidity. There is plenty of liquidity in the market. And that's why the public uh, authorities must be very careful not to, uh, not to interfere to, to the market the wrong way. And, uh, but for instance, because of changing banking regulation or because of uh, to need to strengthen capital base of the banks in some particular member states, banks cannot take that much risk as they could just a few years ago. So that is the reason why, why um, EFSI can make a difference, just to cover part of the private investor's risk. But uh, risk taking is also a cultural issue. And uh, this is something which the political decision maker cannot change at least overnight. The American risk taking culture is um, different than the average European risk-taking culture. Right. But um, even though we cannot change the, this culture so fast, we can provide risk financing and maybe it help over time to, to look at the, if, if you fail, it's not the end of the world, but always it's uh, beneficial or useful to be entrepreneur and innovator. And shifting focus a little bit more to the single digital market and your work in that area, there's been so much attention, so much hype over the roaming fees and some criticism that it's taken a bit too long to repeal that. Where is the commission in that review and how do you answer the criticism that it's been too slow? So we have already decided to ban the roaming fee. And it's, um, I mean, it's a basic infrastructure for uh, mobile technologies or mobile uh, telecom sector. So. Um, it's a little bit similar to type of thing than auctioning uh, frequencies. You have to look how much money you want to collect from the industry in the initial stage and what impact it has to the further development of the products and services. So um, I, I think the banning roaming fees will enable to, to grow business and, and consume products much more than, than uh, with the roaming fees. 
Okay, and I think we're just about running out of time, but Mikkel, if you would just give us a closing statement on your experience as an entrepreneur, what is one change you would like to see from Europe? I'm going back to that. Basically, the, the, these gentlemen are providing uh, capital to a market, but I, I still, you know, I'm still lacking the, like I said, I like, I'm, I'm lacking the commercial banks, the risk-taking commercial bank structures that, you know, is very widely spread in the U.S. And, and as an example, the EIB can't take any equity. Sure. So, you know, the, the, the hybrid models are very limited for them to work with, the risk-taking. So if there's something we could do there, and, and uh, that could be really good, that could, that could actually spare the head, uh, you know, development here. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.